Marks to say about George Kennedy, of whom this uh, series is named. Well, there is a connection there. I, I, I did want to say that it's a, a, just a pleasure for me uh, to be here in Milwaukee. It's a city with which I have, okay, three small connections. One of them not so small. Uh, the first one is the fact that the first time I ever came here, uh, it was to come from Madison uh, with the only copy, it was thought, uh, of a speech that was to be given that evening in the major arena. Uh, this was in March of 1968 uh, by Senator Eugene McCarthy. Um, and in those days, you, you didn't have fax, you didn't have email, so when you needed to get a document to someone, you put a teenager in a Cessna and sent them down. When I got here, it developed he already had a copy of his speech, so it was totally unnecessary. The uh, other connect second connection, a little bit peripheral, but maybe not so much, is with George Kennett, uh, who uh, shared the cover of Time magazine with my father and with Edwin Reischauer uh, in uh, early 1961, when the three were named by President Kennedy to serve as United States ambassadors. A very significant development in two respects. One, because it, it demonstrated to uh, the world how seriously President Kennedy took the ambassadorial function, the importance of placing people, uh, and I say with no false modesty, of real distinction uh, in that position. Uh, and secondly, because at least in my father's case and George Kennan's case, they were going to the leading countries of the non-aligned movement, to India in my father's case and to Yugoslavia uh, in Kennan's case. Kennan had been thrown out of the Soviet Union, declared persona non grata in the early 1950s, and so the fact that he was uh, uh, designated to represent the U.S. with Marshal Tito uh, was a, a fact of significance, of great significance, uh, to, uh, to the Yugoslavs at the time and to the world, and suggested that the U.S. was open to an alternative to a harsh Cold War policy. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to have at least that distant uh, connection to this very distinguished uh, Milwaukee. And the other one, the third one, is deeply personal, very long-lasting, uh, and it has the fact that one of the closest relationships I ever formed in my life uh, was with a, uh, a man for whom I worked, with whom I worked for uh, eight years, really, from 1974 until he retired in 1982, first on the staff of the Banking Committee and then as uh, his staff director at the Joint Economic Committee, and that was Congressman Henry Royce, uh, a figure of great distinction, originality, and true brilliance, and true distinction in the audience you know, I, I just uh, wanted to say that on that account especially, it's a true thrill for me to be here uh, in Milwaukee. Well, thank you, uh, James. And uh, just as you have this long-standing connection with our state, we're hoping that Giannis will develop one as we go forward. Uh, so let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about austerity. And I'll open it up to five of you to uh, begin to engage this uh, theme. Of just what is it? I mean, what's its genesis? And, uh, how did it come to be applied as the kind of go-to policy prescription in both Europe and the United States, and increasingly in other parts of the world? Go ahead, Giannis. Well, if you are talking about the roots of the phenomenon, of the idea, there is a combination. There is the historical uh, connection between austerity and the ruling class's objection, on the one hand, uh, to have to pay for a state which was essential for the maintenance of the peace which was necessary for them to remain as the ruling class, and at the same time having to, to, to pay for it. So they wanted it, and they didn't want to pay for it. And the fear was that they the, 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 their political representatives of the ruling class of themselves uh, would become a bit apathy and would start doing things on their behalf. Now, you, you can see that kind of um, paradox 
surviving in the politicians and the politics attitude towards the Fed, and not just in this country, but towards central banks. So you will have noticed that in most countries there is a, a, almost a dogma these days, a dictum, according to which the central bank should be independent of the politicians. There's a fear that the politicians will use the, the power of the state in order to uh, pay for services that ingratiate themselves with the electorate. So th th there was always that. There's also another element of it, which is more psychological. Let me remind you that after the Black Death in Europe, in medieval Europe, uh, if you held an opinion poll, there were no opinion polls back then, but I think we can speculate, that if you had an, an opinion poll and you asked the average European whether they felt that they were responsible for the Black Death and whether there should be self-flagellation and whether they should be punished by God, I would say that 85, 90% would have said yes. So after a crisis, the combination of the political imperative to pass the buck on to those who didn't cause the crisis, together with the, majorities, those who didn't, the majority of those who didn't cause the crisis, readiness to accept responsibility at a moral, psychological level. I, the, having said all that, in the final analysis, as I was just intimating, it's a question of who, who pays the bill for a crisis. And austerity is a denial of the causes of the crisis and the political project for making those who didn't cause it pay for it. I think that's essentially right, and I would put it in more concrete terms in the following way. After the Great Depression, in 19, the Great Crash in 1929, and the Depression of the early 1930s, it became necessary to reconstruct uh, the world economy, national economies, on some other principles. And those principles were articulated in the United States they were developed to a substantial extent right here in Wisconsin. They included core conceptions of social insurance, unemployment insurance, social security, a minimum wage, ultimately the Fair Labor Standards Act, and the, uh, the, uh, the rights of collective bargaining, and later on, health insurance. A whole range of uh, devices which enable a large, integrated, still substantially capitalist economy to function adequately and even to grow and prosper in the post-war period. Uh, and these programs have always had their irreconcilable enemies, their unreconciled opposition from the beginning because they curtailed the unlimited economic power of the people that Franklin Roosevelt called the economic royalists. Because they created a alternative body of institutions, public institutions, which play an important role in people's lives and continue to do so. Let's just talk for a second about the Affordable Care Act. What is the objection to that which has emerged most vigorously in recent weeks. It's the realization that the Affordable Care Act permits a certain number of people to walk away from their jobs and not suffer terrible consequences if they do. And that, you can tell, touches still a nerve with certain parts of, let's call it the economic, those who are economically empowered. They don't like it. Uh, austerity is the embodiment of a policy intended to roll back those institutions, those protections, those, that amount of, of that, those aspects of our social system which the 20th century built up and created. Uh, and uh, in Europe, in the United States, we, this has been going on for a long time. This campaign has been going on before the crisis, during the crisis, after the crisis. Uh, so it's not a new thing, it's just that in a crisis you get uh, an extra impetus because governments are strapped. Their tax revenues go down. If they're state and local governments, of course, they, they have to react to that in some way. In some cases, they don't have 
uh, an option they're under pressure from their creditors and they have to respond somehow. Uh, in Europe, uh, we have the additional problem that as the European economy became integrated, uh, the richer, larger countries of Northern Europe declined to take responsibility for a comprehensive social system. So that every tub, in some sense, was sitting on their own bottom, and when the crisis hit, there was no effective safety net for the countries in the Mediterranean or for Ireland. So that made the situation in Europe actually more difficult and harsher, both politically and psychologically and economically, uh, than proved to be the case here. If I may just add, yes. uh, just to reinforce uh, James's point, a year ago, I think it was, I was in London and I was having lunch with a member of the House of Lords on the side of the Conservative Party. And I, I always enjoy hearing, um, you know, the horse's mouth speak, <laughs> so to speak. And he said to I'm me... I'm sorry, which part of the horse's anatomy was speaking? <laughs> <laughs> the mouth. Oh, okay. okay. Um, and, and, and he put more or less, I think, the same point that uh, James has just articulated in straightforward terms that I do not believe uh, can be misconstrued in any way or form. He said to me, listen, after 1945, we, you can imagine who we is or where, made huge concessions to them. We allowed them a national health service. Later on, we even built universities for their children and paid for them. After 1991, there was no longer any reason to continue doing it, and we stopped paying for them. One final twist. A few months ago, a heroic journalist from, I believe, the Irish Independent, it wasn't the Irish Times, I believe it was the Irish Independent newspaper, spent countless hours listening in to uh, recordings of telephone conversations between executives of Anglo-Irish uh, Bank, one of the failed Irish banks that was eventually uh, saved to the tune of tens of billions of euros by the Irish taxpayer, who then had to suffer huge austerity uh, in exchange for the loans that Ireland received from the European Union and the IMF to pay for that bank. And what that journalist did was to sit down and transcribe these conversations and present the nice bits. I invite you to have a look at these, just Google it, you can find it. Uh, Anglo-Irish telephone recorded, Irish independent, just put something in like that in Google and you find it. Just to listen to these managers, that was a couple of days before the bank went bankrupt. The way that they were talking about, the manner in which they would transfer all their losses onto the Central Bank of Ireland and the Exchequer and the Treasury. Very instructive about the role of austerity in modern society. So we have this class dimension to this issue, which you've nicely articulated, uh, but then there's also the economics of it as well. And of course, those two are related. But um, I'd like us to give some uh, uh, treatment to, some engagement with the actual economics of it. So we know that the argument for it goes something as follows, that at a certain point, wages and benefits rose too high, that this starved the economy of investment capital, that this then starved the economy of the needed resources in order to produce the research and development of the new products that it required in order to continue growing, that additionally we had competition from low-wage manufacturers overseas, and thus in order to have a high growth economy an economy that would continue to grow, we needed to uh, reduce expenditures. Now, arguably we've done that. Now, 
The counter argument within economics to that kind of supply side thinking is that you have something, of course, called the fallacy of composition, in which if all players, all nations, begin this kind of budget cutting, uh, if they all also begin to cut wages, that it then creates a downward cycle or spiral of reduced demand. And the economy overall uh, suffers. And just weighing these two different perspectives, uh, what's your view on them, and what would you say the merits and demerits of each are? Well, look, it's clearly, I think, possible for uh, an economic entity to act as a magnet for low wage activity by providing a kind of sheltered environment for that. It is possible, that is to say, in the case of an entity which is relatively small and which has a large neighbor who will move activity in there, overcoming, if you like, the direct effect of the policy. And we observe that from time to time. We observe it in the case of, let's say, neighboring cities that try to provide low tax environments for businesses. It's essentially a similar kind of argument. It is absolutely not possible for a large or even a middle-sized country or even a relatively small country, I mean, it's something that's above the scale of very small to achieve this, which is why the arguments for the success of austerity that one hears uh, tend to uh, emphasize the country that you're familiar with, Latvia. Excuse me, what is the population of Latvia? Two million. Two million. So we're talking about something that's on an order of about one third or less of Wisconsin. So that's what we're talking about. If you're talking on that scale, and oh, sorry, what is the population of its large neighboring economy, which I believe is called Russia? 50 times, right. 70 times as much. So, okay, that's the kind of thing that we, where, where it's a plausible case. But if you're talking Greece, which has 11 million people, when Greece goes through these cuts, or if you're talking Wisconsin, which has uh, the last time I looked, it was 6.9 million, which I, impressed me because it was exactly the same as Denmark, but uh, uh, maybe it's a little more than You're talking about an entity which is large enough that when it engages in these cuts, it is in effect shooting itself in the foot, right? What it is doing is weakening its educational institutions, causing its skilled professionals to, to emigrate, it's weakening it's manufacturing facilities, causing investment to go elsewhere. It's weakening its infrastructure, raising the costs for businesses, not lowering them. It's doing everything which will, it's also lowering the incomes of its citizens, which means that all the small businesses are losing business. And the reality is that a, a, an economy which is worthy of the name which is actually functions as a more or less self-contained unit, has to provide its own foundation of activity for the most part. It can't rely on the rest of the world to bail it out of its own failure to support itself and to support its citizens. And that is, I think, the fundamental fall fallacy of scaling up this notion of austerity to the size of any entity that is relevant or meaningful to us as policymakers, basically. Well, just to emphasize uh, and reinforce your point a little bit, using the Canadian Latvia, a country that I know uh, quite a bit about and have lived in for some five years on and on, and have published quite a bit on as well. Uh, in that case, austerity was imposed and it resulted in, over the past decade, 14% of its working age population leaving. So it's kind of an Old Testament like exodus. Uh, from a land which became very poor to the promised land, I guess, of the United Kingdom and Ireland. And so they, they, all, make, they make a desert and call it peace. Exactly. Uh, it's uh, like a carpet. So, if you're willing to do that, if you think about the United States, if that percentage of the population 
left, you would be talking about an exodus somewhere in the range of 30 million people. As I've often commented before, I don't think Canada or Mexico are willing to take some 30 million Americans and provide jobs for them. So while, again, some of these small countries, just as you say, James, can do this, uh, but with great, great pain, it's just simply not replicable, just as you were stating, with larger countries. But moving on a little bit and thinking about how Europe has fared with austerity versus the United States, could you talk a little bit about the structural differences between the European Union and the United States, which has resulted in the United States, for all of its problems, uh, doing somewhat better than the EU on the whole has since the 2008 crisis? As Jamie was saying before, the United States underwent a major transformation after the Great Depression with the New Deal and then perhaps definitely later with the Great Society. Now, those experiences created within the United States some important mechanisms that act as shock absorbers during crisis, shock absorbers that Europe lacks. So, in 1929, what we had was a breakdown of the gold standard. The gold standard was what? It was a, 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 a kind of common currency without common institutions and without any way of transferring surpluses from one jurisdiction to another, especially during the times of crisis, in order to uh, lessen the impact of a cascading crisis. This is precisely the kind of system that we built up in Europe with the Eurozone. The Eurozone is a copy of the great, of the great, of the gold standard which brought about the Great Depression. So, in precisely the way that 1929 started the process which, as you all recall, under Herbert Hoover, tried to deal with the crisis by means of competitive austerity, and competitive devaluation uh, once the gold standard broke down and the result was the grapes of wrath. Well, this is what we have in Europe because we didn't learn from the, the lessons that the Americans had learned. We created a common currency union resembling the gold standard that lacked the following. Let's be concrete here. What did it lack that America created after 1929 under FDR and then later LBJ? It lacked a unified banking system. So the Greek state had to salvage the Greek banks, the Spanish state, the Spanish banks, the Italian Spain, uh, state, the Italian banks, and the result was that those governments went bankrupt in the process. <laughs> Ireland, of course, is a great example. So that's one thing that we didn't have. America did because of the FDIC uh, and the fact that all banks independently of where they are domiciled, the state of Wisconsin or the state of Texas or the, the state of Nevada, are, fall under one jurisdiction, one supervisor, they get recapitalized in unison by TARP if need be. Europe doesn't have that. The second thing that we don't have is any form of common debt. Imagine if you, in the United States you only had state debt and no federal debt. Now, that would be great for the federal government, but trust me, it would be highly destabilizing if following a shock like that of the earthquake of 2008, you had recession, you know, Main Street being infected by Wall Street, and then the state of Wisconsin had to pay for its unemployment, increased unemployment benefits and other kinds of social security payments, by borrowing in the international markets. It would have been a, desire, a calamity, which is exactly what happened in Europe. And the third thing we do not have in Europe is any mechanism, common mechanism, for alleviating intense poverty. Like, for instance, a food stamp system, which, together with other such provisions in the United States, ensure that the poverty uh, ra ratio, the ratio of the population that falls under the poverty line, is half what it would have been without those uh, elements. So we have none of these shock absorbers in Europe. 
We have a gold standard that went the way that the gold standard of 1929 went without the New Deal and without the rational approach to the problem. Instead, we have consistent, harsh, vulgar denial, which is trying to solve the problem by means of two things. Lending to the insolvent, and two, demanding of them that they shrink their national income from which they will have to pay for the old and the new debts. I don't think that David, the devil would have found a better way of destroying the European continent. Very, very quickly, I, I, James, I just, just, like, just very quickly, yeah. I mean, it seems that what you're saying is that one of the great ironies here is that the attempt by so many governors in the United States and of much of Congress to kind of roll back uh, the New Deal and to bring us to a kind of pre-New Deal economy, um, that the only thing that has really kept this economy from collapsing are the very New Deal policies that they have not been able to use us. So in other words, you have federal payments, such as Social Security, which go out to all the states, redistribute income back to them, and introduce uh, some fertilizer, so to speak, into the uh, economic soil, uh, generating some demand in the economy. It's a hugely stabilizing force in the United States. We are often told by our European friends that we lack social welfare protections. And it's true that our social welfare protections are very uneven. But the reality is that they do exist, and they have existed for the better part of a century, and they play an enormous role. In 1972, uh, about one third of the elderly population of the United States was deeply poor, I mean, truly destitute. That number, over the course of uh, 10 or 15 years, dropped to less than 10 percent. The elderly population of the United States, by and large, was lifted out of poverty by Social Security and medical insurance. That's a reality. Uh, the, in, the, in the crisis, a whole range of payments went up substantially. And very interestingly, just almost fortuitous, Social Security went up by, I think, $250 on average because of the oil price increases in 2008. So people got some extra income the next year from the cost of living adjustment. Unemployment insurance, of course, picked up for as long as it lasted, a great many people who were thrown out of work. Food stamps went up until they covered 70 million people. These things have a very important effect in stabilizing people in their homes and their communities. Now, homes were a matter because a lot of people went underwater and faced foreclosure, and that was a calamity that we dealt with extremely poorly. But on these other things, the matters would have been incomparably worse if those programs had not been in place. Mm -hmm. Now, in Europe, if you look at the average over the whole European economy, the picture is not so terribly different. Why not? Because Germany is a very big economy, France is a very big economy, Britain is a very big economy, and they all have these stabilizing measures. So the same programs at the national level worked in those countries. The drama and the calamity in Europe is that those measures were denied or worse, removed from the other countries. So they simply were not allowed to operate in Greece. They were not where pensions were cut, where employment insurances had existed all. I mean, it's... Uh, it, For 10% of the unemployed. Okay. So you, where you have enormous failures along these, regards, along these lines. In Spain, where you have a youth unemployment rate on the order of 50? 50, 55%. Yeah. Greece is 68. Spectacular, basically, collapse of the labor market for those people who are most anxious to begin their working lives and who need jobs in order to form the foundation of any kind of economic autonomy. Uh, a major collapse, of course, in, in housing, uh, especially serious in Spain. And one can go down the list. And it's simply the stabilizing mechanisms, which do still operate in North Europe, don't operate at all in the South. May I add one wrinkle here that 
while it is true that you have social security systems in places like Germany and France, which are much stronger, always were much stronger than in the periphery, and there you have this kind of fragmentation and uh, differential degree of uh, uh, social welfare provision in the different member states of the Eurozone, we have a situation where all these states are being marched off the cliff of competitive austerity. Because if you look at what's going on, even in Germany as we speak, the standards of welfare provision there are falling because local politicians at the state level, at the town hall level, at the federal level, feel that they have to give the good example to the profligate uh, Italians and, uh, and, and Greeks and so on by reducing welfare provision in their own countries. So, whereas here in the United States you have a situation where the, the welfare safety net operates as a st stabilizing factor. You have a situation where, you know, in, in states with higher than average unemployment, the unemployment benefits are being paid by Washington, so effectively that constitutes a transfer, a surplus, in, uh, sorry, a recycling system whereby surpluses from other states are coming to the hardly hit states, supporting the unemployed, and therefore it is like you know, transferring a tranche of cash from the stronger states to the weaker states. And this is not a question of philanthropy, it's a question of stabilizing the, Fed the dollar zone. In Europe we have exactly the opposite, and not only that, not only are there transfers from the stronger states uh, sorry, from the, uh, from the weaker states to the stronger states. But on top of that, you have a diminution of, the, uh, of welfare provision throughout the, the Eurozone, which creates both local and Eurozone-wide forces of destabilization. James, did you... Uh, well, we, we, go ahead. Uh, we can come back to, the, to where things are, are fraying in the United States, because they obviously right. are. Right. Well, well, and, and I think that's where I want to go as well. Yeah. So in, in recent decades, what we've seen in the United States is a, a great deal of downward pressure on wages. Now, this initially was associated with an increase in the price of assets, first equities, uh, later housing. And so these all seem to be means of generating demand in an economy that could still uh, produce much of the way of goods and services, uh, which also, because of its tremendous borrowing power internationally, uh, could purchase goods from abroad. Uh, but, but now we've uh, reached a point where we can't seem to generate the demand internally to consume what can be produced. Uh, and so we, we find ourselves in a situation with, uh, not of course on the scale of Greece, but relatively high unemployment. And we have to remember that when we have millions of people on board, that's not wealth in terms of goods and services that are being contributed to the economy, that could be uh, And they also have mounting debts. So, so this all seems a consequence in part of, again, these downward uh, pressures on wages. So, uh, James, perhaps you could speak to what might be done in order to Well, let me, let, me, let me first just take up the question of some of the things, some of the many things that we did wrong in this country. And we can go back to the uh, period that, where I cut my teeth politically and uh, where we witnessed the, the industrial crash of the upper Midwest in the early 1980s with uh, very high interest rates, mass unemployment, vast the uh, increased value of the dollar and all the, 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 the advanced firms that uh, that populated this region and disappeared under that pressure. Uh, and we've been following a path which is, was set in those years substantially ever since. Uh, but just to cut the story short and just focus on the last 10 or 15 years, uh, it's obvious that we uh, placed an enormous uh, reliance on uh, an artificial and fraudulent mechanism of economic growth, which was mortgage finance, right? which was the extending of loans aggressively on aggress by aggressively deregulated institutions to people who had no hope 
of paying those loans on the original terms and would either have to refinance or default. And this process was fostered in the 1990s and 2000s as a substitute for any, uh, let's say, a normally acceptable mechanism of having growth and employment. Uh, so the deregulation and the consequent corruption of the banking system was at the root of the world crisis, including in Europe. Uh, the crisis, that is, the deregulation in the United States was at the root of the crisis, including Europe. That's the first point. Secondly, when the crisis hit, we allowed the uh, finances of the governments all through the federal system to become deeply destabilized. Some of that was helped by the stimulus package, but the reality was that gave the upper hand to the forces of aggressive austerity and union busting and wage cutting all throughout uh, the country. And uh, I, 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 there is, I think, a, it's probably not a, a mystery to you that there's a notable example of it uh, 90 minutes up the road uh, in Madison. Uh, so that's. When we could have prevented that from happening uh, from the outset of the crisis, we, we, failed, uh, we failed to do that. Uh, and we have approached the question of how to bring ourselves out of this crisis with a great lack of imagination. We have not reformed the banking system, which it's a huge incubus on the economy. It's basically a fixed cost. You have to pay the interest, but you get nothing back from these loans, uh, from this system. You have to somehow afford the, the, the pay and the bonuses and the, the staff and the office buildings of the four or five large banks. But are they making business loans? Are they making industrial loans? Are they fostering employment? No, they're not. And we have failed to create the new institutions and the new to implement the new ideas that would put people back to work. So while the unemployment rate has come down, the main reason for that is that people have left the labor force. They've left the labor force and they're not likely to return to it. The number of jobs is way off what it uh, would have been on a reasonable track 10 or 15 years back. So let's think a little bit about, uh, aside from new regulatory measures, and especially the finance, because as you say, in fact, I'm not, you know, I don't think regulatory measures for the banking system is an adequate answer. The reality is we should have taken over several of the major institutions, and Sheila Baer, a Republican appointee, would have taken over Citigroup and Bank of America in 2009 if she had not been blocked by the Secretary of the Treasury, Timothy Geithner, a Democratic appointee. So frankly, the professionals to whom she was responding were in favor of doing what I'm recommending, what I say we should have done. Taken over those institutions, uh, done a complete and effective audit of their operations, replaced their top executives, downsized them, broken them up, restructured the system, and set a new banking system to work doing things that need to be done in this country. Which is what Sweden did in 1992. Which is exactly, exactly, exactly the Swedish solution. That so what the, what the Swedes did was they briefly made their banking system a public utility. And then once they reorganized it. Six months. Yes, then they sold it back off to the private sector, but in a, a restructured way. Uh, but of course, they came back to haunt uh, both the Baltic states, the Baltic states <laughs> and other regional uh, 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 nations as well in terms of aggressive uh, lending. Some of that, of course, being from the carrying trade. But the point know, is the United States does this too. The United States government takes over failed banks every week. It just takes over small ones. A certain set of banks have been exempted from this, frankly, because the officials of the government were either too, they were either terrified to take them on, or one could argue. Too friendly. Uh, yes, that's a charitable way of putting it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's one side of the ledger. So we have the problem of. Uh, institutions that are supposed to be, in principle, lending to promote uh, growth in the real sector, production of goods and services, but instead we have a credit sector which through speculation 
has done just the opposite. But, but what about on the demand side of the equation as well? So in this uh, city, we had an attempt to uh, put forward a living wage campaign. It seems to be uh, potentially obstructed by a measure of the state legislature, which would limit its ability to be uh, uh, implemented. But what do you think of minimum wages, the raising of minimum wages, as a way to address the, the crisis of demand in the future? Well, I'm a, I'm a great proponent of a substantially higher minimum wage. Uh, I have been on record now for several years calling for a federal minimum wage of $12 uh, an hour. So I think the $10.10 .10 that the president has called for is obviously a step in the right direction, but it's only maybe a half step uh, in the direction that we should take. Why do you want to go up to a substantially higher level? because it would make a very significant difference to a much larger number of workers. Uh, a $12 minimum wage would give at least some gain to about 30% of the working population, and a very substantial gain to those who are really far below that, uh, uh, that threshold. What would that mean? It would mean that they would, their consumption patterns would change. They would have more money in their pockets, uh, and they would be patronizing a, uh, the, the small businesses in their communities and raising the whole life of their communities to a higher standard. Now, it's true that on the business side, that would mean higher costs for some businesses, but it also means more money coming in the door. And that, so far as we can tell from looking at the experience, for example, of the United Kingdom, which implemented a minimum wage that it had never had for the first time in 1999, has been raising it since, is basically a wash. It's uncontroversial now in the UK because the claims that there would be a lot of jobs lost simply didn't prove to be correct. So what we would see, and particularly in my part of the country, and I live in an area which has much lower average wages in Texas than is the case historically here, uh, you would see a real social change beginning to take effect. It would also mean that the difference between what you make if you are in a union, what you make if you're not in a union, would be reduced, which would lower employer resistance to accepting unions. So you would have a whole series of social changes uh, that would follow upon having a substantially higher floor uh, for, for wages. Would this mean, if, uh, a, would this be enough to restore uh, you know, full employment levels of demand? No, the numbers I see are on the order of uh, we worked out that in California it would be worth $15 billion a year. Uh, the whole country is probably about 10 times that, so $150 billion a year. That's not peanuts, uh, and it would make a very significant difference in the service economy where most of these workers are located. Uh, but, so and I would take it as a, as a very substantial step, which has another very important advantage from the standpoint of the austerity debate, which is it doesn't cost the federal government money. Federal workers are all paid more than the minimum wage, more than $12 an hour. Anyway, there are a handful of contract employees who are affected by the recent president's executive order. Uh, but the main point is that it would raise payroll tax revenues. It would reduce food stamps payments to people who are already employed. It would reduce payout under the earned income tax credit. So it would be, from the standpoint of the federal budget, a net gain. You can't argue against it on austerity grounds. The opponents of minimum wages claim that minimum wages affect adversely the people who are supposedly to benefit from them because by pushing the price of labor up, you are pricing labor out of the market and you will increase unemployment or reduce jobs. That's a standard argument, right? Now, if you take this logic to its natural conclusion, it should lead you to the statement that an abolition of minimum wages or a reduction of existing minimum wages should increase employment. Well, I come from a country, Greece, where we had a very interesting natural experiment only last year, about a year and a half ago. We reduced minimum wages by 35%. We were forced to by the Troika of lenders. What happened to employment? 
Employment was falling because we are in a crisis. Did the massive reduction in minimum wages decelerate uh, the fall in employment? No, it accelerated it. And it accelerated magnificently. So this is adding to the empirical evidence that uh, James referred to from Britain. Now, the, why is it that labor doesn't work like potatoes? And in the case of potatoes in the farmer's market, if you have an excess supply of potatoes, you reduce the price, you get rid of them. If you increase the price and you have excess supply, right, <laughs> you're not going to sell them. You're going to sell fewer of them. Well, the fundamental, of course, difference is that when you, it's, it's twofold. The first one is that um, in the case of laborers, workers, their wage is also a source of income from which expenditure will come out. Whereas potato, you can't say the, thing, the same thing about people eating potatoes. Uh, and secondly, very important, in a country in which there has been a concentration of labor market power in the hands of conglomerates like Walmart, what you have is a situation where Walmart pays wages that are lower than they would have been had there been competition in the labor market. Because as we know, where Walmart goes, small shops close down, and Walmart becomes do a, a, a monopsonist, the opposite of a monopolist, in the labor market of the region. Which means that it has a capacity, by reducing its employment, it, the number of jobs it offers to local to the local labor market to push wages below what they would have been had that been a competitive <coughs> labor market. I'm speaking the language of economists who usually oppose minimum wages to turn it around and to say that in precisely the same way that if you have a monopoly and you introduce a maximum price, you are effectively forcing the monopoly to produce more. Because what, why is the reason for them producing less? If a monopolist makes monopoly profits by restricting output and pushing the price up. But if they can't push the price up beyond a certain level, because there's a legis legislation that imposes a, a, a price cap, then the best way of making money within that constraint is to produce more. Similarly, Walmart, if there is a minimum wage which is higher than what it is now, may very well find it in its own interests to offer more jobs to the local labor market. So it's, there, there is a multiplicity of reasons as to why it makes perfect economic sense to increase minimum wages and why employment, not only will it not suffer if minimum wages increase, but it may very well improve handsomely for two reasons, both microeconomic, both because, of the, because you are effectively Steamrolling over monopsony power of the local labor markets, and for macroeconomic reasons, because you are increasing demand. A couple of points on that. One is that if I remember my news reading of the last week or so correctly, uh, I believe Walmart has figured this out, and the chief executive of Walmart came out in favor of a higher federal minimum wage. What they don't want, of course, is to be targeted with an ordinance that says they have to pay $15 while their competitors can pay eight. But if everybody has to pay 10, exactly. they've actually uh, in favor of that. And so I say, give them a credit for, for, for coming out of the Stone Age on that issue. Uh, the other thing is, a, a, a couple of, a week or so ago, I moderated a panel, not unlike this one, on this question of the minimum wage uh, in Austin. And one of our, the panelists was a colleague of ours, a former mayor, first African-American woman mayor of Atlanta, Shirley Franklin, who talked about the consequences of having raised wages at the bottom of the pay scale of the city of Atlanta in her tenure. Um, and uh, it was very interesting because what had impressed her from that experience was the very dramatic effect on turnover, which went down, and job performance, which went up, in particular things like, as she said, do the workers show up on the day after a snowstorm? Right? This matters, and if they're being paid at a decent rate, they have a certain pride in that job, which is not there uh, if they're being, if the, if the job is really 
so low paid as to be really a disgrace and disreputable to them. Uh, and that I thought was a very, it was a very interesting point. And there was also a question in that argument of one of the pe other people on the panel is you have to have a professor of economics from, to uh, make these arguments was that the beneficiaries of the minimum wage were largely the uh, kids of well-off middle-class families. So I asked Mayor Franklin uh, if any of these low-wage workers uh, in Atlanta were in fact from wealthy middle-class families. Uh, and you can imagine the look that she gave me as to <laughs> when she finally recognized what the question was about. Was, you know, what, what planet are you in fact on? Well, well, Wall, 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 just, just one minute, just yeah, briefly, yeah. just, you know, Wall Street bankers seem to recognize the argument for giving incentives to people to show up and, you know, to be at the top of their game by paying them high wages. But they don't seem to care about extending that logic to other people. Well, when Wall Street is doing well, they call it a performance bonus. When they're doing very, very poorly, it's called a retention bonus. So either way, <laughs> they seem to believe in this logic. Let's take them to task. I, I, I think we're now at the point, and I would love to carry this conversation forward, but I, I want to ensure that our audience have an opportunity to participate. So uh, if you would like to uh, advance a question, please clue up to the microphone here. Uh, I'm going to ask, and of course you always hear this, but I'm hoping that you take it seriously, that we, we keep the questions very short, and then I'm hoping that uh, our participants uh, uh, in our discussion up here on the stage will also be the same with their answers. Let's no, the, the point answers. of having short questions is so that we can give long answers. <laughs> and vice versa. <laughs> Yes, a bit better. Okay, great. Although it's true that the United States has something to cheer up by having federally funded safety nets like food stamps and unemployment compensation, there seems to be a safety net feature that is not here in the United States that we should have, and they have some sort of federally funded job program for people who are unemployed and no longer have unemployment compensation. If you look at the statistics, more than half of the people that are unemployed have no unemployment compensation anymore. So could you speak to the safety net of having a federally funded jobs program like the WPA, like the CCC, or even a federally funded jobs program for the people on Friday and next week, so that people who want to work and cannot find a job at least have some income? How can we have such a program, we support such a program, how do we develop a political bill uh, to create it? Okay, uh, well, first of all, I'll say that one of the assignments I had as a young member of the congressional staff uh, on behalf of Henry Royce was to help with the drafting of what became the Humphrey Hawkins Full Employment Act. Uh, so this issue of uh, how, you, how you provide jobs for everybody has been something I've wrestled with, at least conceptually, my entire uh, professional life. I think it's a hard question. Uh, I do remember the Comprehensive Employment and Training Act, uh, which was uh, not as, I mean, it was actually a pretty good program in, in the Carter years, uh, but it fell afoul of a lot of political pressures, as I think people remember. Could we go back and redo the WPA and the PWA and the CCC? I think it would be very hard in this day and age to do that because we're not talking about very large populations of mostly young men displaced from farms. Right? We're talking about a very different kind of population that would be uh, looking for uh, employment and the kind of employment that those programs provided is now very heavily automated. So it's a very heavily done by people driving heavy machinery. So, to me, this is a very difficult aspect, a very difficult challenge. How do you meet that challenge? I would meet it primarily uh, with uh, jobs that require uh, competent human labor. Uh, there are no, we have an aging population, 
There are an enormous number of caring jobs that could be created if that was done in a proper and effective way that would raise the living standard of people who require care and raise the living standard of people who provide it. And so what, that, what, what has to be done there, it seems to me, is to create permanent nonprofit institutions in a way which is politically viable and decentralized. The difficulty of the New Deal formula is that when you create a federal program, basically funding it on a sustainable basis is an extraordinarily difficult political trick. And I would, if I could, if I could wave a wand, I might go that route. But since I can't wave a wand, I'm in some sense reduced to being ingenious about how to create the jobs we need to get the work that we done that we need that needs doing done. One could go on into the energy area. There are lots of different ways that we could use diverse talents. But it does strike me that you need to have uh, decentralized institutions uh, with very clearly defined purposes to get that job done, and, we'll, and, and that are that are capable of surviving for a long time. The Community Reinvestment Act was enacted in 1977, uh, and its purpose was to oblige depository institutions that took money uh, from, let's say, African American communities to make loans to those same communities. So the issue here was whether banks were going to be removing funds from communities that already had or whether they were going to be, as part of their commitment to those communities, providing lending that they were refusing to do in the practice known as red lines. This is not what brought on the financial crisis. What brought on the crisis of mortgage finance 30 years later, in 2007, was largely the behavior of institutions that were not subject to the Community Reinvestment Act because they did not take deposits uh, anywhere or in minority communities. We are talking about companies like Ameriquist, which was a mortgage financing company that raised its money on the capital markets and lent it out extravagantly to people it knew would never be able to pay. An entirely different business model. You should read Joseph Nocera and Pepini McLean's rather wonderful book, All the Devils Are Here, about how Ameriquest's loans officers were greeted at work with a welcome to work uh, kit that consisted of scissors and whiteout. Uh, this was to help them with their preparation of loan documentation uh, and how their job performance was enhanced by uh, providing these officers who used the telephone to peddle their mortgages with uh, crystal methamphetamine. Uh, that's a business model. I was on a panel once with uh, Neil, uh, uh, the uh, uh, former head, uh, Special Inspector General of the, uh, of the uh, Troubled Asset Release Pro Program, Borofsky. Uh, a prosecutor, and I asked him whether uh, knowledge of that behavior might, as a professional prosecutor, strike him as slightly, uh, let's say, slightly untoward from uh, an ethical standpoint, and he agreed that yes, that was the case. So, I, I, frankly, we're, we're, I think the, the, the charge that was made against the Community Reinvestment Act is substantially unfounded. Uh, as at least as it applies to the mortgage tobacco that developed in 2000.
that exploded in 2007, well, 2008. Well, not only that, but much of the money that was lent out was going to, uh, to the suburban development, so it was going to uh, the areas around Las Vegas. Well, it was, no. It, there, were, there, were, there were, in all fairness on that point, there were loans going to uh, subdivisions that would never be right. inhabited because uh, the people to whom those houses were sold didn't have the money to move in. And there were loans going to people who actually were in their houses, had been there for a long time, loans that would flip five or six times in a year and would end up, you'd end up with a huge balance that, you, it was, that was far more than you ever saw uh, that did not achieve the purpose, might be fixing a roof or something that you needed to have done, uh, and you'd end up in foreclosure. So they were basically neighborhood wrecking loans by a, a, an utterly uh, entities that should not have been allowed to function. A short comment on uh, the quotation by Mrs. Thatcher. I do believe, too, that we should be very careful when we're dealing with other people's money. The tragedy is that the practitioners of austerity are not at all careful with other people's money. Because let, 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 let me give you the European perspective here. The very same political leaders who impose harsh, stringent austerity with real human victims as a result are the ones that are enforcing upon the governments of the European periphery the largest loans in human history that the average hard-working German, Dutch, fin Finnish taxpayer has to back up in order to push this money into the governments of Rome, Athens, Madrid, and so on, so that they then try to repay unpayable banking losses. And this is a kind of Ponzi austerity, because it's exactly the opposite of a Ponzi, Ponzi scheme. So that's my point, that those who usually invoke Mrs. Thatcher and the need to be careful with other people's money are the ones that are most profligate with other people's money and lives. So uh, you, were, you were saying, I, I think, at the, at the paper this afternoon, the first step would be from the, for the, the Germans and the others to stop making loans to the Greeks. Exactly. That has always been, when, whenever I'm asked what should happen in the Eurozone, is, the first thing is to stop lending my government and the government of Spain and of Ireland money that is backed by, you know, hard-working people for the purposes of bailing out bankrupt bankers while their banks remember, remain zombies. This is an important principle which I think has an application on both sides of the Atlantic, which is that you have to have a plan for resolving defunct banking institutions. Right? There are situations when a bank or a savings and loan may be underwater and you keep it going because you think it can recover. But when you are in a situation where the institution is not serving any public function, it's not serving any social function, then because that institution exists on the sufferance of the, of the, of the public, it's a chartered institution, exists for certain purposes, the government not only has the authority, but it also has the duty to intervene and to restructure those institutions. Banks are not created for their own sake, or at least they shouldn't be. I see that it says uh, a modern proposal escape austerity and debt. And I think you already hinted at this, but as an economics high school teacher, um, I have students that look at the charts Yes, there are. Uh, let's, let's distinguish two kinds of debt. The debt held by private individuals, households, and businesses, and the debt held by the national government, or issued by the national government. Uh, when you see those lines going through the roof in the private sector, it does mean that you are going to face, generally that you're going to face trouble. Because when the private sector can't pay its debts, it 
has to default bankruptcy restructure. And that's a very difficult, painful process. And the same is true, by the way, for cities, as we're, we're seeing in the case of Detroit. In the case of the federal government, there are times when you want the debt to go up. It needs to go up when the private sector is retrenching in order to stabilize the situation. When the situation is stabilized, the usual path for the federal debt is to basically come to a peak in relation to the size of the economy, and then gradually to come down. And that's a sign that your policy is working. And treating it as more than that, as something that's an absolute imperative to get it down, is going to be counterproductive. Because if you squeeze the federal government when the private sector is also retrenching, you just make the situation for the private sector that much worse. So the important thing to recognize is that these two things do tend to act as a kind of balance to each other. In a normal situation, you want private de debt to expand and the federal debt to be more or less stable. In abnormal situations, there are other possibilities that become really what you have to do. Well, as, as teachers, because you mentioned, you, you, you posed that question as a teacher, high school teacher, one of our primary responsibilities, pedagogically speaking, is to help our students discern the difference between cause and effect. The fact that debt has been going up, public debt, um, can be thought of as a cause or it can be thought of as an effect. It is my considered op opinion, at least here, I uh, don't know whether the others agree, that the reason why we're in this Maya internationally, not just in, in the United States or in Europe, uh, is not due to the profligacy of the public sector. What has happened was we had the, the, the greatest profligacy of the banking sector and the private sector, which created bubbles, which then burst, and then, of course, the taxpayer had to shoulder that debt. But to think of this as a public debt crisis is to get the direction of causality wrong, and this is what, as teachers, we should teach our students how not to do. You've got to get to the mic, yeah. Is that better? Yes. Yeah, I, I just want to mention that we only have a little bit more than 10 minutes left, so... Why don't we take all the questions? That's sure. a good, that's that's a good point. point, yeah. We'll take them all. Please. And then we'll, we'll, we'll respond at, at the end. We'll respond collectively.
this will be the last one here. Okay. You know, first of all, I'd like to mention the discussion of absolute the strength of every aspect. The only thing that I'd like to make is that there has been a very extensive and intensive discussion of what didn't work in the case of Greece or, you know, uh, the United States and so forth. What is really interesting is that every single case that was brought up here is not functioning and unlikely and unrecommendable. His work to put capacity in the case of Chile. So the question is, how come in the case of Chile, all these experiments presumably fail and be very successful? And to a certain extent, which is the case is very well known, but it creates a certain moment of doubt about some of the argument. And we would also like to conclude one thing that is more less important to talk about the question. There is an island in Greece. And presumably, there, there is a large number of people who receive government subsidies for blindness that they hide in the inhabitants. Or to make it something different, all the taxi drivers, the subsidies for blindness, are the same work. And you have, you know, some people go through an innumerable case of similar cases of corruption. And the question is, is this serious enough? Should it be considered? Can it be considered? Or should we lift our hands and say, well, this is an exceptional case? Thank you. I will just accept it. I just want to answer very quickly on Chile, if I may. One thing we have to remember about Chile is that much of its copper sector is nationalized, and it's more or less uh, pushed through these reforms in an era in which China was rising. So massive uh, exports of copper at ever-increasing prices to a China that was beginning to industrialize, clear cutting of force, which is not sustainable over time, uh, a growing agricultural sector, which is sustainable. Um, so it, it, it's, it's developed an export economy, and it's done very, very well, but it's been very dependent on the rise of China. And so I, I don't know how long that situation will continue with Chile. By the way, on that, I think one of the interesting things in the world is, has been in the last decade the uh, relative prosperity, deepening democracy and social democracy, and uh, lack of, until very recently, financial crisis in much of South America, which is very, uh, I mean, this is, the, the, the financial crisis has now returned, but this was a very interesting counterpoint to what happened in the United States and Europe. Let me, let me come around, because there was, I think, as part of these questions, a sense that we should be stating what it is that we propose, and Yanis and I, and, Stuart Holland are the co-authors of a proposal, uh, which is called the Modest Proposal, it originates with, with uh, Giannis and Stuart, uh, for resolving uh, the particular crisis of the Eurozone. Uh, and basically, it falls out of things we've been discussing all evening. They're, they're basically four uh, proposals as part of what we suggest, all of which are crafted so as to be feasible within the framework of existing European treaties. So no grand schemes to convert Europe into a United States of Europe here. Uh, but things that could be done and should be done if only the governments of North Europe, of the creditor states, decided that they wanted to preserve the economies of the European Union, of the Eurozone, and the viability of, the, of, of Europe going forward. Point, point number one, you have to resolve the debts of the uh, major debtor states, and we have a proposal for, in effect, using the European Central Bank uh, as a vehicle for permanently lowering the interest costs and creating a sustainable financial model for all of Europe. Point number two, you have to take the banks which are non-functional and on a case-by-case -case basis deal with them. Uh, and that begins with the banks in the, uh, in the peripheral countries which are presently being handed over to local oligarchs as a kind of political support for 
for, for collapsing political system. That should stop. The, the banks of Greece could be turned over to competent banking author, bankers from outside Greece and begin to get that problem under control. Point number three, to restart investment through the mechanism which already exists of the European Investment Bank. This is, in effect, an infrastructure bank. Uh, and the question came up about what do I think about an infrastructure bank. I think very highly of the idea of a really well-functioning infrastructure bank. So highly, in fact, that the first bill on the subject, which was co-authored by Representative Lee Hamilton and Representative Jim Howard, was in fact written by, well, it wasn't written by me, but it was written by someone who was working directly for me at the time uh, on the Joint Economic Committee. It was a project of the Joint Economic Committee in the early 1980s. It's an excellent model. The European Investment Bank is a very large entity which has been blocked up for various reasons. Unblocking it and getting it moving would be very useful. Point number four, there are many populations which are deeply vulnerable. Kids going to school hungry. Just most extreme cases of social collapse which are underway in Europe should be dealt with directly with solidarity funds to provide relief and also to fight off what is the single greatest danger, which is the rise of uh, new forms of fascism, new forms of Nazism in Greece and elsewhere, violent, xenophobic, anti-immigrant uh, groups which are antithetical to having a uh, essentially stable democracy going forward, uh, something which I uh, we can only hope would never emerge here. Since a couple of questions were posed on Greece yeah. um, by Professor Mamalakis uh, concerning, of course, the corrupt image of the country, uh, I have spent 12 years working for the Greek state. I'm a professor in a public university, uh, so no one can give me lectures <laughs> on the tragedy that is the Greek state and the ever presence and omnipresence of corruption. But let me say that this is not an explanation of why Greece has collapsed. It is utterly irrelevant. It is true and irrelevant. Let me put it simply. You mentioned the by the way, all these reports are hugely exaggerated, but nevertheless, about you know, the, the, the island that has more blind people than, than inhabitants. But and let's even assume that it is correct. The level of public spending in Greece on the social welfare state is lower than the average level in Europe. There are ways in which corrupt practices are finding ways of increasing that spending but it's still not managed to push it anything beyond the average, not the higher echelons, the average of the European Union. Uh, but if you don't believe me, look at another country, Ireland, where no one is claiming that the state is corrupt. Nobody's claiming that the labor markets are not sufficiently elastic. Nobody's claiming that they don't have a strong production fabric which is export-oriented. It has a huge, you know, more, much more than China ever had current account surplus. And yet Ireland is bankrupt. The reasons for Greece's bankruptcy and Ireland's bankruptcy and Spain's bankruptcy are one and the same. A badly designed monetary system. Regarding your question about things that we can do in order to increase liquidity, I have a proposal, perhaps maybe you've read that too, uh, regarding tax credits, and Jamie and I have discussed this many times, but this is not the time or the venue in which to discuss it. Permit me to close with a general statement about austerity. The problem with austerity is not that it is unfair, which it is. The problem with austerity is not that it is anti-democratic and, in the end, undermining democratic institutions, which it does. The problem with austerity is that it does not work. It has never worked, and never will it work, with the odd exception of freeloading. 1996 Canada introduced austerity, and it was freeloading in the United States. 
You can have Germany introduce austerity in the late 1990s, and it was freeloading on the rest of the continent. In other words, importing aggregate demand from the rest of Europe and exporting deflationary forces. The only way you can have your austerity work is if you are a committed freeloader.